We're coming to you from the Tony Remby Rock Auditorium at the Commonwealth Club. It's our first week to week of 2020. Woo! Yes, welcome everybody. <laughs> Uh, you know, a lot has happened and a lot has changed since our last week to week of 2019. Um, I don't think there's been any more serious and earth shattering development, um, frankly, than the uh, decision by Marianne Williamson to drop out of the race. <laughs> she was my spirit animal in this race. Um, now, and I, I know a lot of people, most of them me, have been making fun of her. And, you know, she's a spiritualist. She's a self-help guru. She kind of makes spacey pronouncements and kind of these weird word salad speeches. But um, Stephen Colbert from TV uh, confront, comforts us. And he said, quote, Marianne Williamson is only gone from the campaign if your spirit chooses to experience time <laughs> in a linear fashion, unquote. So, yeah. So don't think I'm tough on her. Actually, someone online called her the Gwyneth Paltrow of Jill Steins. Wow. Wow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Enough of that. I'm John Zipper. I'm your down-to-earth host of Week to Week. And uh, on today's program, obviously, we're going to be discussing the ongoing trial of President Trump in the Senate, uh, so the president versus Iran and other foreign policy matters, the remaining 2020 candidates in the race, and we'll take a quick preview of the new year in politics. And of course, we'll end our night with our live week to week news quiz. Um, I always say everyone's welcome here. So any opinions expressed up here are those solely of the speakers and not of the Commonwealth Club. So let's meet our panelists for today. I will start on the far end of the stage with Carson Bruno. He's the assistant dean and an adjunct lecturer at Pepperdine University's School of Public Policy. He's on Twitter at Carson J.F. Bruno. Welcome back. Carson. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be back. Next to him and joining us for the first time is Molly E. McCluskey. She's an investigative journalist. She's also the creator of Diplomatica and is the editor-at-large of The Diplomatic Courier. She's on Twitter at Molly E. McCluskey. So welcome to the program. <laughs> and next to me is Joe Garofoli. He's the senior political writer for the San Francisco Chronicle, where he is also host of the podcast It's All Political. <laughs> so he's on Twitter at Joe Garofoli. Uh, I hope they distributed some question cards throughout the room. Okay, someone can get those and spread them out and uh, write out some questions, and I'll try to work them into our discussion today. Uh, let's start with the obvious, which is the impeachment trial in the Senate right now. Uh, today, the Democrats are uh, finishing up their third day of presenting the case for the prosecution and removal of President Donald Trump. Tomorrow, the Republican uh, defense, I guess, begins. Um, so let me actually ask or begin with a fairly broad question, and that's just from what you've been seeing so far, we'll start with Joe and just head right down. What do you make of what you're seeing? I mean, what, what's standing out to you right now? Well, the, it's, it's also, it's, I was thinking about this the other day, it's very strange to watch a trial in which the jurors, at least half of them, are, well, they, they know the person on trial, and half of them are friendly with them. So that never happens in a real trial. So it's <laughs> kind of weird, a weird situation. Um, I, was, I had someone on my podcast the other day who is the head of a super PAC, and they are focused on seven states, battleground states in the Midwest. I asked him, how is this affecting people? Do people talk about impeachment at the door? He said, almost never. <laughs> so it is, uh, it is an issue that you know, people who are here, and new, newsworthy news nerds like us, um, are into this. We're, we're following it. It is of the utmost importance. But it's also a story that you kind of know how it ends. You know, ultimately, you know how it ends. There's no way, um, until, <laughs> unless it's the Fifth Avenue scenario with the president, even then, um, that there are going to be 67 senators, or 66, is it 66 or 67, um, who are going to vote to remove him from office. So the drama has been removed. Um, uh, the, the presentation, you know, the, the parts that I saw during my other parts of leaving my day job were really good. I mean, the, the, the shift told the story in a very linear fashion. They used, it, was, it wasn't just, you know, just reading. There was all multimedia presentation. But ultimately, we know how the story ends. Molly, uh, any thoughts so far? 
Well, the thing that strikes me the most about this is, you know, back in 2017, as Trump was coming into office, there was already talk of impeachment, which I covered in 2017 for Middle East Eye when I was when I was covering D.C. for for that publication. But then we thought it would be about the emoluments clause and the conflicts of interest with the hotel and and the different lawsuits that were involved with D.C. and Maryland and lobbying and, and around the hotel. What I find fascinating is the thing that finally brought impeachment um, to Trump was the international piece of it, the foreign piece of it, the attempting to leverage a foreign government. Now, keep in mind, both Clinton um, and Nixon were impeached for crimes committed on U.S. soil. This is the first time an impeachment has dealt with uh, attempting to leverage a foreign government. And I find that incredibly fascinating, and I'm wondering from the values perspective um, of the people that are impeaching him if that's going to make a difference, that it is something Meaning. committed against. That, that that would make them more interested? Sure, in if it was a corrupt land deal or an inappropriate relation with an internship, you know, an intern right. or someone that's breaking mm -hmm. into Watergate, <laughs> you know, that is a very, that's an easy thing to understand. It's, yeah. you know, this land deal benefited that person. Obviously, we are have different stakes of and views of corruption 20 years after the Clinton impeachment than we did then. But, you know, it's, this is the first time and of all of the things that have been levied against Trump since he has come into office, the you know migration camps at the border, the different relationships he's had with foreign governments, the fact that it's this phone call that is finally um, tipping the scales, I find very fascinating. And, and that the entire trial so far has not once mentioned paying off porn stars. <laughs> it hasn't even come up. No. Um, That's why the ratings are down. Paying <laughs> off, paying <laughs> off we'll see. you know, um, Different, pay, you know, paying off different people for different reasons. Uh, the comments he has made about women and immigrants and um, people of color, the uh, physical and verbal attacks on the press, which is, uh, you know, I don't need to point out to Joe, the only constitutionally protected profession is journalism in this country. Uh, all of the many, many Thank things you. that people have been objecting to and complaining about, and both, you know, validly and not, um, the fact that it's this phone call that finally went okay enough, and the fact that it was, you know, one man of power uh, ostensibly leveraging another man of power against a third man of power, oh. and these are all <laughs> white men of a certain age and a certain political standing, <laughs> And that's when people finally went, oh, no, 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 wait, we can't. That's, <laughs> that's a bridge that's too, too far. far. <laughs> that's a bridge too far. So this, to me, is, is what I'm watching very carefully. Okay. Carson, what are you no, seeing right now? I mean, I, I, I have to agree, I mean, with, with, especially with Joe, uh, in that we kind of know what the, what the pie is going to look like coming out of the oven on this one. Um, so it's not so much kind of this, per, this trial per per se, it's kind of what does this mean for future impeachments? What does impeachment look like into the future um, post a, a, a Trump presidency? Um, uh, Victor Davis Hanson, I think, had an article out saying that he opines that the impeachment will become like the new no confidence uh, votes mm -hmm. for Americans, um, that when the House shifts toward uh, the, the other side of the partisanship uh, side, that then they'll use basically the impeachment to say, you know what, we don't like you as president, whoever the president may or may not be. Um, which could be very much the case. We could we could see that really becoming a, a a kind of a routine sort of thing with impeachment. The question, really, I think, kind of going back now to kind of to Molly here, is what does this mean about the presidency in terms of foreign policy? Mm -hmm. You know, we have given the president, Democrats and Republicans, over the course of its history of, of the presidency existing, immense amount of power when it comes to foreign policy in the White House. Uh, unlike on the domestic issues, really uh, speaking so. So th is this a shift toward Congress really taking back power around foreign policy and foreign relations? Who knows? There's a lot of question marks still, but um, it kind of points to that direction that maybe we've kind of gone a little bit too far in how much we allow the president to really go in terms of foreign policy. Because realistically, the president can argue that he was doing what he should be doing within the confines of what Congress has allowed him to do in terms of foreign policy. At the same time, you can easily make the, uh, the other argument that, that Democrats are making. So in a way, Congress has kind of let themselves fall into this situation in terms of what the topic itself is, because there is so much ambiguity around foreign policy and what the presidency can and cannot do, and what Congress can and cannot do, how much Congress can step into the situation. Um, and so I do think the 
DC and the, the power structure will have to grapple with this question moving forward. Will we allow the president to be, have this much control over foreign policy moving forward? Will we allow the impeachment to become a no-confidence vote moving forward? Um, those, I think, are two big things that I don't think we're talking about quite yet So uh, around the impeachment topic today. When George Will was at the Commonwealth Club in 2019, uh, obviously talked about a number of things about Trump. But uh, the one thing he was talking about is how people have said, you know, why, why did Congress let uh, uh, President Trump, you know, take so much power and, and so much control? And he said, if only Trump had taken it. He was, and he was criticizing Congress for giving, you know, to not just Trump, but all, all, you know, a series of presidents, basically letting them take this this control that uh, you know had, at least constitutionally in his interpretation, uh, been reserved for Congress. Um, so George was there before us, but uh, <laughs> we'll see how well, much. The other thing, I think, there there is one bit of suspense, and it does have a political impact, and that's you know, we, there's going to be this argument about. Should they call witnesses? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, why don't the Republicans say, okay, we know we have the votes. So let's just bring in the witnesses. They can say whatever they want. You know what, the, I mean, if they're, uh, uh, what's his name? Bolton is already writing a oh, book. Okay. It's not like it's going to be, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll hear it next week or we'll read it about it in three months. Um, if he wants to sell books, it'll be something juicy. Um, but so why not just do that? Remove the sheen of like, oh, this was an unfair process. It didn't allow witnesses. The Republicans could easily say, let's allow the witnesses, then we'll vote, and then we'll be done with this. But I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not looking that way. But who knows? It's, these things change on the, on the dime. There is. I mean, there's a 2020 implication to this, too. And kind of Nancy Pelosi's kind of holding, not transferring the articles to the Senate. It kind of delayed the process. Mm -hmm. And now we have a situation where you have the senators who are running for president who are kind of stuck in D.C. Um, and not in Iowa, which happens in 10 days. Right. Um, and so there's an element there that was kind of interesting because obviously Senator Schumer had to kind of be involved in those conversations, too, if he didn't want his members of his caucus you know, stuck in D.C. versus Iowa, then would he put pressure on Nancy Pelosi? So there's a little bit of kind of back end dealing that has nothing to really do with Republicans itself um, that kind of creates question marks as well, because it does take Bernie Sanders, it does take Amy Klobuchar, it does take Elizabeth Warren off of the campaign trail in the, really the most important time, because especially Iowa is so close right now. Right. Um, and so right now they're stuck in a D.C. Senate chamber versus a diner in <laughs> Iowa, <laughs> like where they should well, be from a presidential standpoint. But, but they should. Okay, I, you know, I have to take. I appreciate that thought. I have to take a little bit of objection to it because. From a presidential campaign standpoint, sure, they should be in Iowa. They don't have that job yet. Correct, yes. They have the job of senators and congressmen and women. That is the job they need to be doing. And so I always kind of get a little, uh, it's always fascinating to me when people that are running for president put their future job. I get that you run for the job that you want, you dress for the job you don't have yet, <laughs> but... <laughs> When you were in an impeachment trial for the president of the United States, your job is to be stuck in D.C. Yeah. <laughs> Which, I mean, and eating terrible food right, and, right. and you know, not having coffee and having to deal with fidget spinners because you don't know what to do when you can't have your phone. I mean, that is, I would argue, there is no more important place for them to be than, than where they are right now. And I think that for the election, though, if you're a voter in Iowa or elsewhere, wouldn't you want the people that are doing their jobs even if they can't physically be there to eat pie with you in the moment? You would think And so. I've had Iowa pie. You it is some so. damn fine pie. Oh. <laughs> but now personally... Pork, pork chops are <laughs> The pork chops are great. Yeah, um, but, but that's what I would say, is I don't have too much sympathy for people who are stuck in D.C. doing their jobs of impeaching the president. I think that's the most important thing they can be doing right now. But the question is, why, why didn't the leadership push forward to expedite this thing a little bit more so? There was no need for Nancy <coughs> Pelosi to sit on the articles the way that she sat on them, delaying this process to putting it literally just a few days before Iowa caucuses occurring. Sure, and the case could be made that we had <laughs> enough information two years ago, yeah. Yeah. or from the Mueller report, or from you know emoluments, or for when we found out that they paid off Swarmy Daniels, or when 
all of the president's men went to jail ahead of him. I mean, there's, there's, who knows why the timing is such, but the litany of possible charges is longer than, you know, from here to D.C. Yeah. Well, and, and there were some folks who actually, uh, in fact, uh, you know, some never Trumper Republicans or conservatives, uh, Charlie Sykes and, and some others, who, who had actually said she should hold off on transmit. She doesn't need to transmit that to, you know, there was no, there's nothing in the Constitution that says she has to send the uh, impeachment articles to the Senate by Tuesday or something like that. Um, and the argument was basically like, had that dangling over Trump's head. You know, again, we know what will happen, but you're keeping it as a live issue mm -hmm. for longer. I don't know why she then decided to transmit it at the time she did, though from what I read, it kind of sounded like she was her, her caucus was getting antsy. And they didn't, you know, they weren't supporting her and in, in, in holding it any, holding it back anymore. So she made the decision. I have a question from the audience that also questions something about Nancy Pelosi's decisions in, in this. And this is, do you think she made a mistake in kind of what you were just saying, uh, limiting the impeachment articles to those two issues and not going and adding Mueller uh, report uh, material? Yeah, that's what she could get the support for. I mean, she she knows she she is a head counter. And that's what she could get the support for. And the, keeping it short and simple was the, was strategically the best move. Mm -hmm. I mean, to add to that, I think <clears throat> the fact that we have seen all of the things that we've seen over the last two years, and this is the thing that finally tipped the scales, yeah. I, I think says to Joe's point that if they couldn't have gotten it beforehand, they're cer certainly not going to get it when there's 20, 30, 40 charges. If they right. can grab two... And, and push it through. And this, as, as you said earlier, this is already a complex story to understand. You have to keep it simple for people who are picking exactly. this story up in bits and pieces. Nobody is sitting there all day and watching 16 hours of impeachment uh, testimony. <laughs> You're unless not? You, no, unless, no. I have it beamed into my ear right now. <laughs> That's the thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's not just... In, in many cases, you can argue it's more of a political process than is truly Absolutely. a legal process. Sure. And so... From someone like Nancy Pelosi's perspective, she has to think about the politics of it as well. And you need it to be simple because you do need it to be concised into a, a journalist article, into a blog, into a tweet, um, be able to be captured not just by the people making the votes, but also then by the voters. Uh, and so as you start to muddy the kind of the, the waters with too many plot lines, people start to tune out. It's just a, a reality of a blockbuster or of a political impeachment. Mm -hmm. well, so as our exit question from this topic, what do you think the political ramifications are? Nothing, because everyone's already set in their ways, or uh, do you think it will impact Senate races and, or potentially the presidential race? The, the people who are sweating this out, number one, are the, the, the four or five Republican senators in, in swing, uh, sort of uh, swing states, uh, Cory Gardner in, in, in Colorado, Susan Collins in Maine and such. Um, those folks are sweating it out. Um, I think the, the, I mean, the, the timing, this would have to be very quick timing, but the Senate could you know, vote to acquit the president or, or whatever the legal terminology is uh, on the same day as the State of the Union, which would be really <laughs> weird. I mean, he would be, can you imagine that? This morning it was a hoax, the hoax ended, and you know the State of the Union is strong, and the hoax is over. I mean, this would be a huge win for Trump in that way. But I mean, as, as going back to what the you know what we're hearing on the ground in the swing states, this is people care about health care. They care about you know, do I have a job? Why do I why do I have to work three jobs? And this this is kind of low down on the on the totem pole. I mean, my concern obviously is America standing on the global stage, right? Mm -hmm. I, we saw you know, what it looks like when a president undergoing impeachment went and spoke at Davos, you know, to world leaders and business leaders. Um, it, there was not a, there's not a person in that audience that wasn't cringing or smirking or rolling their eyes or wondering what would be next, right? Ukraine still needs American help. Uh, we do not have a permanent ambassador to Ukraine right now. We do not have a permanent ambassador to Chile, which just had to cancel the, a cancel the APEC summit in December and the climate summit in December because of their riots and their protests. Um, we do not have an ambassador to Venezuela. We are missing key diplomatic posts around the world, not from people that spent a million dollars to buy their posts, but from people who understand what diplomacy means 
and how critical it is to some of the things that are happening around the world. However this shakes out, this needs to shake out and it needs to play out and it needs to be done, not only for us, um, but for all of the people around the world that are counting on America for military might, diplomatic intervention, a voice of reason, um, economic stability. <gasps> These things all have massive ramifications around the world. Okay, we'll get into more of that, in fact, in our next topic. Mm -hmm. Carson, political ramifications of this. I think in terms of the presidency, uh, the impeachment itself isn't going to change the needle too much. I think really what's going to matter mostly in terms of how 2020 goes is, A, who the Democrats choose, uh, and B, what the economy is looking like um, as we approach November. Uh, now, that being said, at the House level and on the Senate level, I think it could actually oh. be a kind of a deciding factor in some of these key elections. Uh, it could very well determine whether the, the Democrats take the Senate back or not. <clears throat> uh, people like Cory Gardner and um, Tom Tillis and Susan Collins and uh, Martha um, McSally, or sorry, no. Mark yeah, Excelli, yeah, Arizona, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, are in precarious positions where to, this is not helping them in any sort of way. Uh, the House, it could mean Nancy Pelosi you know, increasing her odds um, or at least kind of holding on to her majority. So politically speaking, it could kind of reshuffle how we see D.C. post-2020. Uh, but for the president, the, the presidential election, it really comes down to who the Democrats nominate and what the economy is looking like, okay. in my opinion. And we'll revisit that also later in the program. Um, uh, for the second topic, I really wanted to get into foreign affairs and, in fact, how the current administration is conducting it. it, it this obviously was sparked by the recent conflict with Iran, uh, which resulted in, well, there was the killing of an Iranian uh, military and intelligence leader, and then the Iranian response was, you know, lobbing some missiles at a U.S. military base in Iraq. Um, there was some saber rattling, and there was some war threatened, um, some upset allies, including Netanyahu in Israel. Um, but both parties kind of seem to not want to go beyond a certain uh, degree, you know, a certain point. Molly, I want to start with you. Uh, what did we did we learn anything about the Iran tensions recently, and probably still ongoing? Um, about how Trump is using his approach to foreign policy in something that becomes a firing, you know, a shooting uh, conflict. Sure. Well, from day one, this president has made foreign policy decisions that benefit him, not necessarily the country, him. Uh, we saw that when his first foreign trip was to Saudi Arabia. Um, we have seen that with his, you know, when he shoved aside the prime minister of Montenegro at a NATO summit a few years ago, the day after having a meeting with Russia. Um, you know, it is unfortunate that we have a reality show tele um, president who, when something happens to him personally or he gets some sort of conflict or attention or criticism personally, he can deflect and split the news cycle um, by doing something pearl-clutching and you know, appalling. Uh, we've seen that time after time. Many, many administrations have looked to Iran and our complicated history with Iran um, to specific generals, to this particular general, and have not taken action. Um, it is a very convenient way to change a new cycle. Um, it is unfortunate that so many Iranians and Americans have been caught in this as a means of you know, distraction for the president. We've seen Iranian Americans detained at the border trying to come back in from Canada and elsewhere. We've seen, you know, rising discrimination. But this is a president that will tweet out a war threat to North Korea without checking with his intelligence officials. And it serves him <clears throat> because it is distracting at various levels of distraction um, from just words to military conflict and troops on the ground. And that has a very real impact. I'm a military, you know, a member of a military family and my brother-in-law was just deployed. So this is something that, you know, I am very um, wary of when I see, you know, escalation of conflict for something that seems to have no basis other than a distraction. And yet he doesn't seem to want, I mean, he, he's made a goal of stopping these endless military entanglements mm -hmm. across uh, foreign lands. And there are arguments of he's pulling back from areas where we should be. 
Um, and then there seems to be the worry, I think, which I think you were getting into, in that even if he doesn't want that, he may stumble into it through his impulses. Is that accurate? Every move benefits him. I mean, in what other administration would you have a foreign government kill an American journalist in one of their embassies and have no action taken? In what other administration would you have the Turkish president directing the assault on uh, Armenian American Amer uh, Armenian Americans in Washington D.C. on D.C. soil in front of the Turkish ambassador's residence and have zero ramifications. These relationships are critical to the president. He has uh, repeatedly stressed his admiration of dictators, um, and these are impacts to our diplomatic core, to our diplomatic standing, to our uh, it sends a message of what this administration will tolerate on American soil, and it's quite frightening, to be honest. And, and no. the, the, the two things are consistent with the president's foreign policy is, one, there, there is no coherent theme to anything. There's no plan. Yeah. Uh, we don't know. It's, it's, as Molly said, it's, it's kind of haphazard all the time. So, like, okay, there's no greater arc of, okay, here's where we're going. Um, and and there's there are these ramifications like even the 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 strike the the the, um, the strike from Iran the, the bombs were dropped but nobody was hurt well now we have we learned that two dozen American soldiers have some sort of traumatic brain injury from that that's just coming out Trump blew that off when he announced oh they, you know it's based some headaches or something but this is serious stuff mm -hmm. um, and now there's uh, even more horrible things potentially on the horizon because North Korea has a new top diplomat who is a military person, really has no diplomatic experience. Mm -hmm. And so now, how's that going to ratchet up the change? The president can, can, uh, can accurately say that we've had, you know, North Korea has not, you know, launched a missile at us or anything like that, but there's, it's still really shaky ground over there. So I, that's what's, everything is on edge. <clears throat> I know you guys have the, um, the Washington Post reporters coming with a couple Weeks here, Rucker and, uh, Lanig. Rucker and Lanig, uh with their new book out, and in that book, not you know, too breaking news, but they, but it, there's a, much more detail about the president really being ignorant of geopolitical situations. Uh, he didn't really know what was hap what had happened at Pearl Harbor. He didn't know. <laughs> I know. Uh, yes, <laughs> there's a lot of good movies you can see about. He could somebody I mean, catch him up early. Right? Yeah, he didn't know <laughs> didn't know about post World War II. Uh, you know how how the geopolitical configuration changed there. So, I mean, it's, you know, and now he's surrounded himself with yes men. The, the, the people yeah. who have, who were, the people who were the truth tellers are gone. And to add to that, I think there's one thing to be said for, if you come in as president and you don't know everything about every nuance of American history or okay. politics or whatever, that's, you get a little bit of room for that, right? Um, but if you're a couple years in and the, people that are around you are trying to inform you and you still decide you don't want that information. That's a different conversation. If your intelligence briefings have to have graphs and charts and your name bolded in every third word so you'll pay attention, that's a different conversation. <laughs> and that's a little, that's a little uh, disheartening. Carson, uh, the book by Philip Rucker and Carol Leonig, uh, am I pronouncing her name correctly? Leonig? Leonig? Yeah. Um, who, by the way, both of them will be here at the club soon. Uh, but it includes this widely shared story about him berating the, uh, the mm -hmm. top military brass in a meeting that I guess had been set up by then Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and uh, Gary Cohn, um, you know, calling them losers, dopes, babies. Uh, has, <laughs> does this, do you think this has done damage to the military's uh, respect for the civilian leadership? And I guess the follow-on to that is what damage has been done to the intelligence department agencies, you know, uh, working with the civilian government. Well, being a complete civilian myself, I can't. I will never speak for the military ever, nor the intelligence community. But I really do feel like they do always have a duty to what their oath is, and so I think regardless of kind of who's holding the presidency, they will always have a respect for the presidency. That doesn't necessarily mean that they will be groused and angry and, and um, a little bit peeved by kind of who may be in currently occupying the Oval Office, um, and they will continue to do what they believe 
is in their power to do, given the constitutional confines. But I have the fullest faith in our military and our national security um, uh, entities to kind of do what they ought to do in the confines of the, the, the Constitution. The big question here is kind of where does the United States stand globally and where should we stand globally? And I would say that a world without the United States being at the forefront of these discussions is a very scary world because who's going to fill that vacuum? China, China mm -hmm. Iran, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia, Russia. Russia. These are not people who uphold any of our values at all. And regardless of your progressive, conservative, Democrat, liberal, Republican, libertarian, green, peace and freedom, uh, whatever you may associate as, Americans do still hold a similar set of values um, that I think has made the world a better place. And so we do want the, the United States to be at the forefront of these discussions and conversations. Um, and currently, either by our own actions or how others have perceived our actions, we're not. And that's, a, that pu that's putting the world on a very precarious, rocky position uh, from a foreign policy and national security perspective. And Molly, how much, how much of an effect do you think has come out of the fact that the Trump administration came in and defunded and de-staffed the uh, State Department. I mean, the, the group oh, that could, if anything, go around and do... I mean, a significant. Yeah. I mean, you know, diplomats, ambassadors serve a critical role, right? They serve the de-escalation role. They serve the role of saying, you know, we don't always agree. We maybe don't have the same values or we're, we're not trying to accomplish the same he thing here, but let's sit down and figure it out. And, you know, I think when Prime Minister Puno was here a couple weeks ago from the Cook Islands and he mentioned that, you know, we don't have representatives go out to the Cook Islands. We don't have envoys go out around the world. I mean, even in Puerto Rico, which is a U.S. territory, to see what's happening there and we don't have folks going and, and saying what's happening on the ground here and how can we help? I mean, these are critical issues. It seems um, we are increasing our military and our equipment and our military spending. That is an industry. It's one of the things that we continue to export around the world as Americans as we export weapons and military. Um, we're not spending nearly as much time or effort or funding on State Department, on cultural diplomacy, on educational diplomacy, on all of the soft diplomacy um, that we used to do for years around the world. This also is a little bit of a political impact. We'll see um, <clears throat> uh, Mayor Mike Bloomberg, former Mayor Mike Bloomberg's uh, new ad take goes right at this, and it goes right at how uh, Trump called, according to this book, uh, the, the general's babies and stuff, and it goes right at his disrespect for the military, which is a really, uh, you don't often see that, a, an ad calling out the commander in chief for his disrespect for the military. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's move on to a topic that's even more contentious. <laughs> yes. we just get warmed wow. up. <laughs> it, it, it's housing in California, <laughs> folks. SB 50 is back in the news. Yes, <laughs> State Senator Scott Weiner has resurrected his bill that would increase housing around public transit and spur higher density housing development. Uh, the bill had been bottled up in a committee, but State Senate President Pro Tem Tony Adkins of San Diego this week plucked the bill from that committee and sent it to the Rules Committee, which she chairs and my mind will start to boggle as I get into committee politics. But <laughs> uh, Carson, let's start with you. If, if the bill passes the Senate, I guess it heads to the Assembly. Um, kind of what I want to get at is Governor Gavin Newsom has said, you know, increasing housing and addressing the housing crisis in this state is a priority. Is he either helping this bill or pushing any alternative or is he taking sides on this? What, what's it, and what should he do? I mean, what sh he should have actually pushed this bill forward at last session um, before I even gone through some of the amendments it's gone through. If he, in fact, claims that he is for California producing the amount of housing that McKinsey reports and other reports have suggested California has to produce in order to even maintain some levels of affordability in this state. Um, but he hasn't because, in my opinion, Governor Newsom likes more of the press releases and, and uh, his name in shiny headlines and he actually likes the action of actually governing um, <laughs> at the state level. 
He might have done great things here in, in San Francisco, but the state level, it's, eh, it's been less uh, impressive in my opinion. Um, what's fascinating about SB50 is that it's getting a lot of visceral hate from a lot of people, mm -hmm. um, when in fact it probably won't do as much as they're claiming it will do. Um, I don't agree much with Senator Scott Weiner, but in terms of housing policy and the future of California, um, I full heartedly believe that he is on, on the right approach. Uh, this state does not have a future economically if, we can't if people can't afford to purchase houses here uh, of any sort, let alone a one bedroom condo to a single family home. Um, the state does not have an economic future if people can't afford to rent here. Mm -hmm. um, and we're on a current path that puts us in that position. We currently are in many parts, places like San Francisco, Los Angeles, where I currently reside, uh, and other parts of the state. And more every single year, more and more so, as we creep inland, it becomes less affordable as well. Uh, so s dramatic action does have to take place. SB 50 is on a pathway there for sure, but it's not going to do what all the naysayers are saying it's going to do. Um, and it's kind of amazing that you have so many people talking housing policy in Sacramento, but yet unwilling to actually do the dramatic changes to policy that require action, which is actually taking more power away from localities. Let's just, let's put it out there. It's local control has caused this problem. We have security that will take you. Yeah, thank you. Out of the building. <laughs> I'm going to need it. Uh, I've, I've seen this crowd. They can, <laughs> they can get ugly. They can get ugly. They, they're big this town. lovely person. <laughs> <crowd. laughs> uh, they, 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 there's some tough people in this I mean, if, if, if you know me, yeah, that's not a surprise <laughs> statement. Um, but uh, it's the truth. And uh, unless we grapple with that reality, then we're going to continue to be uh, priced out of the state. Everyone is. Yeah. Everyone, except the ultra wealthy. Okay, Molly, what do you think? So, you know, I, I'm not as well versed in the nuances of this particular <laughs> bill yeah. uh, as my colleague here, but, you know, there's two trends in California in general that concern me about housing. And the first is um, platforms like Zillow and Trulia and um, other platforms that used to be brokers, facilitators, are now buying houses directly from people that want to sell their houses. Uh, and this is, in California, this is a couple other states, and this to me is incredibly concerning for reasons I probably don't need to tell you, but once they start to control housing stock, once they start to be able to take things off the market and release them to the market at the prices that benefit them, that is incredibly concerning. Um, the second for me is what I see is a glut of empty houses. Uh, around the state. Uh, Vancouver, BC instituted a law about a year ago where there was an empty house tax. And if your house was empty for more than six months, you were charged a fine of 1% of the value of the house. You could rent it for six months, you could you know, live in it, but you could not have houses sitting empty. And we see a lot of houses on the peninsula, throughout the Bay Area, that are investment properties um, from overseas investors and elsewhere. And those are houses that could be rented and could be available to people. And once we release all of those, you know, you start to have less of that supply and demand issue where people cannot find affordable housing. Uh, you know, once those start, you know, all the apartments in San Francisco that are Airbnb, and we've, we've kind of cracked down on that a little bit. But these are houses or apartments that are off the market to people that want to move in for a year and pay an annual monthly, you know, a monthly rent. Um, and it's, it's very concerning that the supply is being restricted by people that benefit and are not living in them. Joel. That, um, the, as Carson was, uh, referred to, the McKinsey report. Here's some raw numbers about how far behind California is. Newsom, when he was running for governor, said uh, his goal was to create 3.5 million houses by 2025. Last year, there was maybe 111 housing permits or 111,000 yeah. housing permits. So we're, we're like way behind. Now, when we ask the governor that, he goes, well, those are aspirational goals. It's like, <laughs> well, they, you ran on them. So they were, you know, goals. Uh, <laughs> Call them whatever you want. Um, Read my lips. We'll have yes, more housing. We will have more housing. <laughs> um, okay. 
on, on that bill, AB 50, he, Newsom is squeezed between a couple of constituencies. That he's, he's still kind of like, yes, I support the concept of AB 50, but SB 50, SB, but, I'm, yeah. but I'm not really with it yet. The reason is, number one, the suburbs hate it. Yeah. Hate the bill. Hate it. Yeah. I did a story a couple months ago about um, in Danville, a uh, well-to-do suburb here in the Bay Area, and uh, uh, they had they had the whole town council out. They had um, the local state senator out, uh, or state uh, assemblywoman out, and to celebrate the first new uh, multifamily housing that they had been built there in forever. It was 144 units, 11 were affordable. They had a, you know, so let's have a piece of cake and celebrate. It's like 11 units. I mean, come on. But that shows how difficult it is to build housing here, the resistance. The other group is people who live in the city. If you build more housing near, near transportation, they feel it will you know, jack up uh, property rates and lead to more gentrification. So this is, Newsom is looking at this and going, oh my God, which side do I pick here? I, you know, so he is staying clear of this. He's got to pick a side because this is, there's parts of this that, that could help. Do you but think he's who, wishing that he, he and could go back in time and he could have run for Senate and Kamala Harris could have run for governor. <laughs> yes. I think he'd be happy still being mayor of San Francisco. He seemed to have a pretty good run. I don't know. But my question is, who, who, who is Gavin Newsom afraid of? Who, He's is, the governor. who is he, he going be. to lose election to? Well, when he runs for president, clearly. Well, if he runs for president, Kevin housing issues are not going to be too concerning for him. Right. Uh, it's... It, it's like, come on, Good have point. actually some political courage. You are in a Democratic state. You won with 60-plus percent of the vote. There's no one on the Republican side who can ever challenge you. And quite frankly, the Democrats seem to be kind of falling in line and kind of just taking what office is available for them instead of challenging people, except for Kevin uh, DeLeon. Uh, <laughs> to, to his credit, at least he's trying to challenge the status quo. Um, again, don't agree with him policy-wise, but I have to. he actually stu stood up and said, the end, let's try to do something here. Uh, it, it's just like, wh why are these people afraid? Because at the end of the day, housing is not just an economic issue, it's a transportation issue. issue. If we want transportation to actually function in this state, you have to have density. Plain and simple. BART ridership is going down. Why? Because people are commuting from Fairfield into San Francisco. Oh, uh, come on. Like in LA, <laughs> people are commuting from San Bernardino into Los Angeles. It's a climate change issue. If we actually care about climate change in the state, which everyone talks ad nauseum about that they care about it, then actually fix the housing situation because we can't fix the housing situation until the transportation situation is fixed. And so Sacramento can continue talking on and on and on and on and on, but at least there are people like Scott Wiener who are actually doing something around the issue itself. The assembly, I will say, is doing a decent job. They actually are authoring bills, passing bills. It's the Senate that continues to be a problem. Okay, well on that note, let's move on to some developments in the presidential primary races. Um, We've seen a couple candidates recently drop out of the race. Cory Booker, the senator from New Jersey, and, of course, Marianne Williamson. Um, <laughs> I don't, don't know cry. why you're laughing. Don't cry. I just It'll couldn't okay. think of the planet the she was the The L.A. representation is <laughs> now gone. Um, but, okay, seriously. Uh, Michael Bloomberg, former mayor of New York, has been spending a lot of money. He's gotten some uptick <laughs> in, in some polling. Um, Joe, you know, what... What is his future? I mean, he's well, surprising it, some folks. He's surprising some folks. He's starting to tick up on a couple of polls. Um, he, you know, he's, and he's trying this very unusual and unprecedented strategy of blowing off the, the early states, and he's going to jump into the race on the day of the California primary and the Super Tuesday. 14 states have their primary on March 3rd. Um, and he is dumping, you know, I think it's, I don't know what the, the, the meter keeps running. It's $200 million already in TV advertising, you know, tons of millions of dollars in, in web advertising, uh, you know, dwarfing everybody but Tom Steyer um, in the race, fellow billionaire. Um, <laughs> and I've seen him in a couple events. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, uh, Mayor Bloomberg is not a big charisma guy. Um, <laughs> but he has been the mayor of New York City for three terms. Yeah. Um, Rudy was also mayor of New York. <laughs> yes, good That's point. not a high bar. <laughs> good point. Good point. He, as he builds up the second most challenging job in the country. Um, so he's, that's what he's selling. I went to an event he had in Oakland uh, a 
first of all, the only event I've ever seen where they, no, it was at the Everett and Jones Barbecue. Anyone ever been there? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they had, they served barbecue there at 1030 in the morning. And so, but, he, but he bought it for everybody. I mean, like everybody who came, 150 people, were like, what, there's free food here? Barbecue? <laughs> and so uh, he's, um, but he, everybody there I talked to was searching. They're like, I like Warren and Buttigieg, but I don't know if they can win. I like Biden, but I don't know if he can win. You know, I, uh, I like Bernie. I don't know. And so they were, uh, uh, Bloomberg is like a second choice for a lot of people. He's like kind of, he's in the bullpen. And they're going to wait and see how these other folks pan out. So, you know, depending on what, if, if Biden looks strong through the first uh, few races, then Bloomberg's chances dwindle. If, if Biden stinks in the first couple races, then uh, Bloom, Bloomberg is, uh, looks a little rosier in people's eyes. People are digging through their freezer for something else to eat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Molly, what, what's your thoughts on you? Oh, my thought is I'll vote in November, but I don't care. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> I, I'm not following it. I don't cover it as a journalist. Mm, no. um, I was a registered Washington, D.C. voter for many years, which meant I didn't really have a vote. I had no right. senators or governor or representatives. So I'm thrilled to be home in California where I do have my full voting rights restored. <laughs> it was the first thing I did when I came home as I, I registered to vote. But no, I'm not paying attention. I could probably name three candidates if I had to. Um, but no, I'll, I'll vote in November. Okay. Carson? What the interesting thing about Bloomberg is, I mean, th th let's, let's look through kind of who's dropped out thus far. I mean, Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, uh, Marianne Williamson. Uh, <laughs> Julian Castro. Uh, yeah. they, they're dropping out because of lack of money. Mm -hmm. that at the, plain and simple, they all have the will for it. They would all keep on going if they could, but they didn't have the, the funds to kind of continue their operations. Um, Bloomberg doesn't have that problem. Tom, Tom Steyer also doesn't have that problem, uh, for that matter. And so they don't have this pressing need to kind of continue to do the fundraising component. Tom Steyer is doing it because he wants to be on stage for the debates. Bloomberg has made that very much a big deal about him not doing that uh, because he is a billionaire and doesn't want to be you know, on the stage because of that reason. Um, so that does change the calculus a little bit for those type of candidates, particularly relative to the other type of candidates who need to continue the fundraising mechanism to really kind of keep on moving forward, because that does give him staying power beyond when he might otherwise, given kind of the political norms, not have that staying power. So he can, unlike a Rudy Giuliani, who decided to jump to Florida uh, in, what year was that? 2008. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, and that completely just backfired on him because he needed the fundraising ability to kind of, but he needed wins uh, to kind of maintain the fundraising ability. Someone like Bloomberg doesn't have to worry about that. So he can kind of hold back and wait and doesn't need to start collecting delegates until Super Tuesday. And if he's been smart about how he's spending and smart, smart about the delegate math, um, then he could come out of Super Tuesday with delegates. That may not mean he has a pathway toward the actual nom nomination, but it does mean, though, he has delegates going into the nomination, which could, theoretically, given that you know this kind of split between Bernie, Warren, uh, Buddha Edge, and, and Biden, that it could change the calculus moving forward. It could. Do we want to be a country, though, where somebody can buy <laughs> their seat on a presidential ballot? I mean, that's that's the thing that I keep coming back to is, you know, the millionaire discussion versus versus the non-millionaire, the working class discussion versus the, see, I have been following it a little bit. <laughs> um, I had you all fooled. Um, <laughs> but the idea that you can buy your seat on the ticket is so distressing to me on a mm -hmm. very fundamental level um, that I just find it very concerning. Yeah. Someone in the audience raises something that I wanted to talk about anyway, which was London Breed, mayor of San Francisco, endorsed Bloomberg. That surprised some folks. Carson, uh, you were one of the first people I saw reporting this. Joe. 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 <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm the guy without the hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, Joe, you were one of the first I, We reporting. broke that story, yes. Yeah. Um, the, uh, well, he's gotten a, a, um, endorsements from a number of mayors. Um, it, uh, San Jose. San Jose Stockton. mayor, Stockton, and, and et cetera. Um, a lot of these mayors have, have 
benefited from training at Bloomberg funded institutes. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And so he's, and he's uh, <laughs> like the Bloomberg, I believe paid for a number of, uh, uh, some training for uh, in San Francisco for homeless uh, people work on homelessness issues. It's not a quid pro quo, but it's like there is, a <laughs> but there is a um, a connection that he's built for years, and you know, it was a it was a known person. It now. And, and today's and social hour, by the way, was brought to you by <laughs> Bloomberg News. <laughs> <laughs> Subscribe now. Uh, now, politically in, in San Francisco, it's a it's Stop a tough it. it's a tough one for Mayor Breed because number one, you're endorsing a billionaire in a city where it, you know it's a it's a living uh, you know uh, illustration of income inequality, and uh, and 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 so it's not it's a it's a tough look for her. Yeah. Uh, Molly, a question I do want to get you into, and that is, Bloomberg, of course, is not just a politician. He runs a media company. Yes. And uh, Bloomberg News reportedly put restrictions on its reporters, uh, barring them from investigating the Democratic candidates. So what do you think about that? Oh, I'm about Bloomberg, to get in trouble. Yeah, Bloomberg the man <laughs> told his Bloomberg reporters no basically right now. who were yeah. complaining, basically tough luck. No, I'm about to say you know, it's going to get me in a lot of trouble. <laughs> when you get a paycheck, you get some restrictions, is what he said. What can you say that won't get you in trouble? But Oh, no, I have see? no problem getting in trouble. Okay, go um, for it. So I will say two things about that. Um, first, I was on the board of governors of the National Press Club for a very long time, um, and Bloomberg loves having his staff as president of the National Press Club and on the board of the National Press Club. It's a running joke around the club. I'm about to get in so much trouble. Um, <laughs> because the position and the status, and, and so on one hand, it's we are a media enterprise, we have prominent journalists, which are true. Every, you know, every person that has served as president of the press club has been a fine, upstanding journalist and citizen, and um, in some cases, friend. Um, however, I also have written for City Lab for many years, mm -hmm. one of my favorite publications, some of the best team I've ever worked with and for, and adore everybody that I've ever worked with there. Bloomberg just acquired City Lab and promptly laid off uh, a majority of the staff. Wow. Uh, wow. That gasp and horror was how I felt too. <laughs> so, I have a hard time, again, back to this millionaire, billionaire um, conversation, I have a very hard time with a politician who would spend as much as he's spending on Facebook ads, um, who says that he espouses beliefs in certain things, mm -hmm. who on the other hand runs a media empire that has benefited him, yeah. um, putting restrictions on that. I mean you do not support journalism by muzzling journalists. You don't, it's, it's not the same thing. So I think there are excellent Bloomberg reporters who are doing, trying to do excellent, important reporting work. Uh, those restrictions and the cuts, um, especially in the face of you know, advertising revenue to Facebook in particular, which mm -hmm. has not been kind to journalism, uh, troubles me greatly. Uh Former Republican strategist Rick Wilson was at the Commonwealth Club earlier this week, and uh, he told our week-to-week -to -week friend Melissa Kane, who was moderating the program, that Bernie Sanders was Donald Trump's preferred candidate. He was, he was Donald Trump's dream candidate because Rick Wilson's prediction would be that Bernie Sanders would lose like 40, 41 states or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, Carson, what do you think of that? <laughs> You, I, I've actually I've actually been thinking about this quite a bit. Kind of who would be the best Democrat, you know, to go up against a Donald Trump? Who would be the worst one? It's really hard. Because <laughs> um, everything's upside down now, right? Nothing makes we, sense anymore. We are kind of living in the up down, upside down zone of politics, um, of kind of what the norms are. It, they all come to the table really with pros and cons in a way that you can legitimately, if a student was submitting a paper about kind of, you know, on this topic, it, I think it would be hard for me to give A's or D's because I'm like, you, <laughs> the, the A papers could be D papers, D papers could be A papers. It's really, really difficult. Um, now, obviously, you want to kind of think about kind of broad strokes and all this sort of stuff, but uh, it's hard. I mean, it really is truly difficult. Um, I'm less dis 
the, the post to, to senators. I don't really think the senators do a good job as president. Um, so you muffled that yeah, a little right, bit. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of trending away from senators, um, <laughs> if that gives you indication of where I might be. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a good thing you're not a journalist. <laughs> you wouldn't be allowed to have right, an opinion yeah, on that. Yeah. Okay. But you know, like, here's the thing. Uh, wh why did Trump win when he won? Part of it had to do. You probably won't like this. Hear this in this audience. Part of it had to do with Hillary Clinton. She ran a bad campaign. She did. She did. I think we're um, back in their also, good Yeah, you got some amens in that. <laughs> <laughs> also, no offense to my journalist folks up here, but the media gave Donald Trump a lot of free media. Yeah. yeah. That enabled him to win the primary and then kind of keep TV on media. rolling. No, TV I was part of rolling. the political <laughs> DC media. media during the 2016, <laughs> and I will take culpability for some of uh, So, I mean, there's the, and then you had the factor of kind of just the kind of the, you know, the eight year itch sort of situation also. So, I mean, uh, just looking at kind of setting aside policy issues, setting aside personality, setting aside kind of those things, there are kind of reasons you can point to about kind of what happened with 2016. So you could go in the angle of kind of focusing on that sort of stuff. Who's going to run a campaign that makes the most sense of getting to 270? Because no matter what Elizabeth Warren says, it's 270 still matters. And it will, moving forward. Um, so we have to think about that. And there's a lot of calculations still to kind of make out there. But we'll see how it unfolds. The nice thing about primaries is that it does help show the voters who can run effective national campaigns because we don't have a national presidential campaign. We have 50 presidential campaigns. And because the way our primary system is set up, they have to run 50 different campaigns, especially more so simultaneously because there's so much clustering around kind of these more kind of Super Tuesday type days. Um, so it will show us kind of who can understand how to organize across big jurisdictions, but also delicate math because that then points to electoral college math. Um, delegate math is complicated, especially on the Democratic side. Oof, you guys like to like throw some calculus in there with the, 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 <laughs> the delegate calculations. But it, it really matters because it's not gonna matter so much necessarily kind of who is the winner coming out of each of these uh, elections, especially how clustered everyone is. It's gonna matter kind of who's coming out with delegates or not. Um, and then kind of who can spin the story in an appropriate way to then make them seem like the winner, even though they may not really be the winner in terms of delegate math. So there's a lot of things moving forward to really kind of pay attention to if you're thinking about that. But unfortunately, unfortunately for California, our ballots start arriving in the next few weeks. And so we'll be voting as Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina are voting uh, well before our primary date is even set. So uh, it'll be fun times here for sure. Okay. Joe, uh, someone in the audience asked about William Weld, the Republican former governor yes. of New Jersey? Uh, but Massachusetts. 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 I Massachusetts. apologize. Yeah. Yes. Um, and you interviewed. Yeah, he was on the Weld. podcast this week. In fact, that ties into your last question. I asked him, I said, who would be, you know, if he were not to get the Republican nomination? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> still early. <laughs> um, he said that the, uh, the toughest candidates he thinks would be uh, a Biden or, or Klobuchar um, would be the, the moderates. He said if it were Bernie or Warren, uh, he said it would be nonstop. That Bernie's a socialist. That would be Trump is you know the the cannon loaded of you know Bernie ads of Bernie and every you know uh, uh, left leaning uh, Central American leader he's been with over the last uh, you know for 40 years or whatever <laughs> and he would just be and Bernie is an admitted democratic socialist i mean older folks have a problem with that younger folks could give a crap so um, you know it's you know but it still would be that's if if Bernie were the nominee be prepared for for that for that's that's where Trump's it's going to be one note okay uh, Prediction with no repercussions if you're wrong. <laughs> well, I was wrong so many times in 2016 on this very stage. Well, yes. oh Who do you God. think will be the next Democrat to drop out of the race? Ooh. Oh. 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 Buta Jess. Sorry? Mayor Pete. Really? Yeah. Is no. he? Oh, my. Wow. Oh, no. I thought I had you all there no, for no, a second. No, no, no. Turn on it's me. All his, all his money comes from California. No, no. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say... Oh, go ahead, Carson. The big names? Because, I mean, there's still tons of, like... 
you know. Yeah, we don't care about the reference. Rand, yeah. like, <laughs> Michael Michael Bennett is still running. Really? Really? Yeah. Yeah. He is. Yes. Yeah. So plus his heart. <laughs> <laughs> So we're talking about like the, I like think the, that's the problem. The, the campaign when you said Izzy still running. That's <laughs> yeah, but I told you I'm not know, as tuned into the daily nuances yeah, of this race out. as you all are. So Carson, who would be your of, of the headliners? I would I would say Senator Klobuchar. Uh, Klobuchar, really? Uh, sure. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, I just don't see her hitting the numbers that she needs to hit uh, to to make the delegate math make out work out for her, uh, as well as then uh, I think her funding will dry up as a result. I, I, nope. Same with Klobuchar. She's she's putting all the chips on the table in Iowa, and uh, she that's that's going to be a tough one for her. And after that, if she doesn't win Iowa, she's not going to do anything in New Hampshire and South Carolina. And, uh, she go Although back I do to her day she, job in the Senate. I would. I mean, I would agree that I think she would perform very well as a nominee. I, I've always put her in kind of my dark horse sort of uh, mm -hmm. category in terms of someone to keep an eye out for. So but if she does like top two in Iowa. It's a new game. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll have a lot more news quiz questions and much more to discuss for sure at our eighth anniversary week to week program on Tuesday, February 18th. Thank you to our great panel today Molly McCluskey, Joe Garofoli, and Carson Bruno. All right. Thank you, everybody, for showing up and everyone who's watching and listening. I'd like to give you an all, it's all political sticker. It's all political. Go to Joe Garofoli <laughs> on Twitter and he'll send you one. If you want to share some of that chocolate, I'll take a bite. Have a great week.